Welcome from San Diego, California. This interactive multinational teleconference is reaching you live in English and Spanish through a unique and complex international telecommunication network via satellite, microwave, and cable. This program brings together distinguished institutions representing education, business, and government in more than a dozen countries in the Americas and Europe. During this video conference, we will examine the growing global communication network, satellite, cable, and wireless systems. This is the 10th International Training Center video conference of the year 2002 series entitled Excellence with a Global Flair. I'm Professor Peter Anderson of the School of Communication here at San Diego State University, and I will be your moderator for this program. Technology is transforming the planet. Thousands of technological innovations, such as this program, for example, are changing the face of nearly every society. Modern telecommunication technology brings voice, text, and data to our homes, our offices, and to mobile wireless devices. At the core of this telecommunication revolution is the Internet, a technology capable of transcending the nation-state revolutionizing the sharing of information and transforming work and play. It is not hyperbole to suggest that the Internet is the equivalent of the advent of television, the invention of the motor vehicle, or the inception of the Industrial Revolution itself. Today, the infant Internet is already obsolete with increasing demands for higher bandwidth and new capabilities coming from numerous quarters, streaming video, teenagers exchanging mp3 music files, scholars sharing data, and the wireless web third generation telephony and our inundation with email are providing new demands, opportunities, and stressors on our technology and on us. Business people today must separate the wheat from the chaff. The decision to invest in technology is a difficult one. Failure to act may mean obsolescence and the collapse of a company. Investment in the wrong technology may create untenable costs without corresponding benefits. The right choices of technology may provide huge competitive advantages. Where does a business person go in the world where technology moves from cutting edge to commonplace to obsolete in a matter of a few years? This video conference will present the growing challenge of selecting and integrating satellite cable and wireless communication technologies to maximize an organization's productivity and performance. Interactive video communications will play an increasingly strategic role as distance activity becomes more commonplace throughout the world. The invited speakers will review trends and applications of multimodal, multimedia, and multi-technology communications with important messages for decision makers and users. Walter Johnson, a CEO of Telecom Design Corporation established in 1977 to develop cost-effective telecommunications infrastructure for business and education, is also Senior Associate for Global Infrastructure Solutions within the Strategy Group Incorporated, specializing in the use of internet and telecommunications for accelerated learning in both public schools and universities. Mr. Johnson is co-founder of World Wide Wireless Web Corp, W4, which operates the America's Net International Satellite Internet Gateway, co-located at the San Diego Supercomputer Center, with both high-speed web connectivity, Internet2, and other Internet networks for universities and research centers. Since founding SAT Networks International in 1990, Mr. Johnson has been active in the engineering, marketing, and operation of innovative satellite and wireless networks in Mexico and Latin America. He was director and chief technology officer at Business Satellite Networks Incorporated. Mr. Johnson's background in business and technology extends back to 1969 when he founded COSTCOM that supplied the transmission equipment for the national radio networks of Canada, Brazil, Mexico, Saudi Arabia, Iran, 
Uganda, Taiwan, Korea, Algeria, Thailand, and several other nations. Mr. Johnson worked with Dr. Henry Kissinger's China team to airlift this Earth station to Beijing, China, and establish the history-making satellite link for the U.S. for President Nixon's trip to China. Mr. Johnson received his BSEE degree from the University of Idaho and has published over 30 papers and holds three patents related to satellite network transmission. Mr. Rick Strobridge is a leading expert in telemedicine, advanced operating room design, and medical technology integration. As Vice President of Strategic Programs for Stryker, an S&P 500 medical products manufacturer with almost $3 billion in annual sales and operations in 170 countries, he specializes in the improvement of healthcare delivery through the use of integrated telecommunications and multimedia technology. Mr. Strobridge is a pioneer in voice, video, and data networking, video conferencing, and distance learning. He implemented some of the first video networks for the U.S. federal government and the Department of Defense. His career includes many firsts in the video networking field, including the first high-speed multipoint still image delivery system, the first VSAT satellite-based video conferencing system, and the first compressed motion video arrangement system. Mr. Strobridge was also responsible for the first video conferencing system installed in the U.S. Capitol. His career includes 10 years at the $7 billion systems integrator, SAIC, where he founded the company's telecommunication systems operation. In 1991, Mr. Strobridge founded Teleimages Incorporated, a video conferencing systems integration company whose customers include Hewlett Packard, the U.S. Navy, California State University, and the Bank of America. A Denver firm acquired Teleimages in 1997. In the same year, Mr. Strobridge co-founded Infomedix Corporation uh, to address the growing need for more efficient and comprehensive multimedia communications in operating rooms. Infomedix was acquired by Stryker Corporation in 1999. Mr. Strobridge is a graduate of Colgate University in New York and is listed in Who's Who in California and Who's Who of American Business Leaders. Gentlemen, let's start with this question. How does a business, a university, or a government choose among cable, copper, fiber optics, wireless loops, or satellite in the race for greater bandwidth? Well, I think <clears throat> the decision the manager must make is really dependent upon his the quality of his local infrastructure and where he's located. Uh, wireless distribution is ideal for a campus, a office building, or for a metropolitan area network. Uh, if you're located along the coastline, uh, there's often good fiber connectivity. If you're inland, you're dependent upon the national infrastructure, which is often not optimized for internet. So satellite may be your choice. Yeah. The answer is there's communication wherever you go. You just have to pick the right, the right one that's available. And is cost a factor? Sometimes cost is a factor. I mean, many times uh, you're limited in your choices, uh, especially in, in rural areas. Uh, however, uh, the, the, the answer is that the bandwidth is available. You just need to find the right technology to use. Okay. Well, thanks for those excellent insights. We'll hear more in a minute. Let's now begin with Module 1. Thank you. It's my sincere honor to be one of the speakers today. I would like to thank the International Training Center and its staff for the opportunity to share with you what I have learned recently about the state of the global telecommunications industry. I would like to give you some insight into the current state of global telecommunications. We will look into the financial ripple effect dot-coms have had on the telecommunications industry and the stock market in general. This will include some insight into how bankruptcy is used in the United States by corporations to recover from financial disaster. 
Then we will discuss how you can use the Internet to keep up to date on the latest changes in the telecom industry. Last but equally important, I will share with you some projections for continued growth in the various sectors of the telecommunications industry in spite of troubles surrounding some of the large players in the United States. A report from the Milken Institute noted that despite the dot-com meltdown and the slowdown in the tech sector in the past two years, high tech is as crucial as ever to economic growth. The demise of far-fetched internet businesses hardly refutes the fact that new technology is changing the rules in many sectors of the economy. I feel it is important that we understand how we got to where the telecommunications industry is today. The introduction of websites in the early 90s, 1990s to the then tightly controlled academic internet ultimately resulted in the public takeover of the internet. The number of websites exploded and what was an academic research network became the worldwide facilitator of e-commerce and information distribution. The boom in dot-com businesses and the resulting euphoria led investors to invest heavily in anything related to dot-coms including the internet backbone providers. Workers began to feel that the stock market, which was driven by dot-coms, was the key to a comfortable retirement and became heavily invested in stocks. The retirement dollars and other wealth that flowed into dot-com stocks inflated the stock prices to the point where Amazon.com was worth more than Sears, one of the U.S.'s largest retailers and with decades of history and thousands of employees. The dot-coms assumed that they could raise money from investors indefinitely and built their business plans and spending habits accordingly. Going public became a way to instant personal wealth. The lack of profit-orientated dot-coms caused investors to have second thoughts when subsequent rounds of investment were needed. At the same time, the spending rate of dot-coms was flying so high that when investment slowed, they immediately ran out of cash, nosed over, crashed, and burned. Concurrently, the telecom industry overexpanded to meet the projected dot-com uh, demand. What I call the ripple effect started with the overnight collapse of the second round of funding for dot-coms and their resulting demise. This left the telecommunications industry with huge debt and no dot-com customers to help pay off the debt. This in turn resulted in the meltdown of the telecommunications industry with big name bankruptcies a weekly occurrence. To date, over $100 billion of debt has been written off in U.S. bankruptcy proceedings. This is more than the national debt of many nations of the world. The meltdown of the value of telecommunications stock on top of the crash of the dot-com started a downward spiral of the value of high-tech stocks and a loss of investor confidence in the stock market as a whole. Along came the terrorist destruction of the World Trade Center and the resulting uncertainty as to what was next. This, along with the loss in value of high-tech stocks, pushed the market lower and moved the projected recovery out into the future. As if this wasn't enough, the ripple effect on high-tech stocks caused investors to more closely look at the dealings of big-name telecommunications companies. What they found was inflated executive compensation to match the dot-com executive salaries and creative accounting to satisfy the investors' demand for dot-com type stock prices. To quote Glenn Bischoff in last month's Telephony magazine, lousy business plans, bankruptcies, and accounting misdeeds have destroyed whatever faith investors once had. Keep in mind that this is mostly a high-tech investment phenomenon. The basics of the rest of the business world and general economy to continue to move forward and grow. In the United States, bankruptcy is often used by companies to recover as a recovery tool for past misdeeds or financial disaster. After these companies go through bankruptcy court, they seem to emerge with forgiven debt 
and a new business plan. For example, 360 Networks is said to have come out of bankruptcy with $135 million in cash and had its debt reduced from $2.7 billion to just $0.2 billion. The total debt of the 14 major U.S. telecommunications service providers that have filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy reorganization over the last 18 months comes to $95.8 billion. Chapter 11 of the U.S. Bankruptcy Code provides a framework for business to reorganize. In contrast, Chapter 7 solely involves liquidation of a company's assets and the distribution of the net proceeds to creditors in accordance with the priorities set forth in the code. During the bankruptcy process, the companies often continue to do business with no noticeable changes in the quality of service given clients. When you place a long distance call on MCI WorldCom, there is no noticeable change that would indicate they are in bankruptcy. For me, the internet has changed the entire way I keep up with current events and trends in business and technologies I'm interested in. I've canceled most of my subscriptions to paper magazines and rely more and more on web publications and daily email newsletters. Of particular value is the fact that I get newsletters from Europe, Asia, and Latin America with equal ease. This gives me a much broader perspective. The bibliography of this program includes a number of newsletters, most of which are free along with the websites of a number of magazines that have gone online. You can keep up to date in Buenos Aires or Havana just as easily as I can in San Diego. Much of the statistics and insight in my presentation today come from online newsletters. I would like to cite some statistics to show that the internet usage continues to grow despite dot-com bust the loss of confidence in the stock market, and world political turmoil. The Cyber Atlas estimates that the current worldwide Internet population to be 446 million and that it will grow to 710 million in just two years. They estimate the current active Internet users in Argentina to be 2 million, Brazil 6 million, Cuba only 60,000. Mexico is 2.3 million, and Venezuela 1.2 million. Spain is estimated at 7 million, Portugal 3 million, the United Kingdom 33 million, Russia 7.5 million, and China 34 million active users online. The latest number from Comscore Media Matrix says that the United States internet population grew to 119 million users in July of 2002, up 92 million users from the year before. Total usage minutes were measured at 106 billion in July 2002, up 62% from 70 billion a year ago. Minutes per user climbed to 14.9 hours per user per month. Yahoo set the uh, site record in July, bringing in 83.4 million users. At the same time, Internet 2 is coming into its own. If the folks at Internet 2 have their way, the current web will gradually be replaced by technology that they have developed and field tested, an Internet that is faster, multimedia friendly, and more consistent in the quality of service. Internet 2 is a research and development consortium of over 190 universities, about 70 companies, and 40 other organizations that are using high-performance networks to test new technologies and develop new applications. In March of 2001, the consortium announced a new policy that allows expanded access to non-Internet 2 member schools. As of August 2002, literally thousands of additional schools and 24 state education networks have connected. It is now possible for qualified universities and research centers around the world to connect to Internet 2. The San Diego Supercomputer Center, the largest such center for academic research, 
is a major node on Internet2, as well as numerous other research and commercial networks. Co-located, there is a large satellite hub capable of direct Internet connections to universities throughout the Americas. The global fiber network is like a network of global freeways with local on-ramps and streets. The dot-com explosion caused the carriers to build huge networks of fiber freeways that are currently said to be only 5% utilized. As we discussed earlier, the debt associated with building these fiber freeways is at the heart of the troubles of Global Crossing, WorldCom, and many others. Overbuilding for a couple of years is not the same as glut, said Richard Mack, an analyst for KMI, a market research firm in Providence, Rhode Island. The investment to lay hundreds of fibers is not much greater than the cost of laying a single strand. By contrast, the actual lighting of a fiber to carry information requires uh, installation and switching equipment that costs eight to ten times as much as the fiber itself. What did not get built is many of the on-ramps and local streets connecting users to the global fiber freeway. You can see from the KMI map of fiber connectivity in Latin America that the coastal cities are connected to the global fiber. But fiber networks inside the country are very limited. This same pattern is common in Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. The rural areas of the U.S. lack good fiber connectivity to the Internet backbone. At the same time, there is overcapacity between U.S. cities. This is a major area of concern in Congress and state governments and has led to the generation of the term digital divide. This pattern can also be found in countries with large rural areas such as Australia, Canada, China, India, and Russia. There is very little fiber connectivity to individual clients. Users are still limited by the local copper loops. For the next five years, I do not think you will see much expansion of the U.S. and global fiber freeway. Many telecommunications companies are currently overburdened with debt associated with the fiber freeways and cannot borrow money to build in-country fiber on-ramps and local streets. This will also significantly slow the expansion of in-country networks around the world funded by U.S. companies. The wireless local area network market is posed for double-digit growth. To quote Bill Gates, if any technology has emerged in the past few years that will be explosive in its impact, it is 802.11 wireless LANs or local area networks. Gartner Inc. indicates that North America is the largest region for wireless LAN equipment sales, as it is projected to account for 63% of shipments in the year 2002. The surge in wireless LAN market is uh, expected to continue through 2003 with revenue reaching $2.8 billion, up from $2.1 billion in 2002. Regulatory restrictions in Europe and Latin America have delayed adoption. This issue is now being resolved, said Andy Rolf, principal analyst for Gartner. Rolf added that there is also a strong demand for mobile computing devices in Asia Pacific, particularly in Japan. This will result in the strongest wireless LAN growth outside of North America. The increase in wireless LAN enabled personal computers and personal digital assistants will drive demand for wireless LAN access in a variety of locations to support business applications. These include homes for teleworkers and hotspots such as airports, train stations, libraries, university campuses, and public buildings. Total home installations are growing 20% a year, spurred by the popularity of low-cost wireless broadband gateway products. The cable industry is growing digital video and broadband services, despite recent economic uncertainties. 
according to the survey from the National Cable Telecommunications Association. The number of digital cable customers totaled 16.8 million at the end of the second quarter. And customers for cable's local telephone service increased to 2.1 million, the association said. U.S. cable operators are ending the third quarter 2002 with more than 10 million high-speed internet customers. The two key obstacles to rapid growth in the digital cable services are regulatory barriers and modern two-way digital cable plant. There is emerging a trend away from conventional telephone lines to internet, cable TV, and wireless telephone services. Today, international voice traffic on the internet represents 13% of the world market and about 20% of the Latin American long distance market. In five years, it is expected that over 50% of long distance calls worldwide will be carried on the internet. Trans-Pacific Telecom of San Diego is offering long distance calls to Argentina for 10 cents a minute and uh, to Mexico for 17 cents a minute. Calls on the public switch network can be as much as a dollar and a half per minute. Another growing provider of local telephone service are cable TV companies. They are giving major discounts to subscribers who sign up for a package of premium TV channels, internet, and cable telephone service. We are also seeing a shift from landline telephone to wireless phones, even in the United States where the penetration of landline telephones is nearly 100%. We're seeing the growth take place in the wireless phones, while landline telephones have lost actually 4% of their market. Recently, when SBC, one of the U.S.'s largest telephone companies, let go 11,000 employees, the company said the, a large factor was a loss so far this year of revenue from 3 million local access lines. This shift away from circuit switch telephone service, along with the financial troubles of U.S. telephone companies, is causing grave concern among government officials about the reliability and quality of telephone service in the United States. Some are pushing for a move away from open competition. On the other hand, recently a group of Internet analysts and business executives sent an open letter to the Federal Communications Commission urging the Commission to resist telephone company efforts to prop up businesses that were technologically um, obsolete. Just let the telecoms fail, and fail fast, the letter urges. Like the rest of the telecom industry, the satellite industry is seeing losses in one sector, while another sector continues to grow. The growth is coming from direct-to-home TV service, internet connectivity, and broadcast video distribution, nearly all of which are handled by established geostationary satellites. The losses are in recent ventures utilizing KA band or low Earth orbit satellites like Iridium, Global Star, and Teledesic. Greg Kersey, research director for, with uh, Frost and Sullivan, recently commented. The plan of Teledesic's co-founders, Craig McCaw and Bill Gates, to create an internet in the sky network looks like it is permanently grounded. Low Earth orbit satellite or LEO networks like Teledesic requires tens if not hundreds of satellites to cover the Earth. This translates into an investment of billions of dollars to build and launch the satellites compared to 300 million for a single geostationary satellite, or GEO, that covers all of North and South America. If you have to recover $6 billion in investment, your prices must be significantly higher to the point few can afford the service. Even traditional GEO satellite internet service is expensive, costing about $5,000 per megabit per month for dedicated bandwidth versus $900 in the U.S. fiber network.